Toppled Talk. So welcome back, folks. Monty Mython here, back for part two of our live event coming to you from the Association of Eastists Winter Scientific Meeting at the Queen Elizabeth II Centre here in the heart of London. This is one of our live dinner events. Again, to remind you, generously sponsored by GE Healthcare. Another shout out to GE Healthcare. Thank you, folks. So three guests tonight on a broad range of topics. We've already heard from Matt Wiles and Marcus Peck. Matt talking to us mainly about depth of anaesthesia monitoring. I know we're not supposed to call it that, but you know what I mean. I do. Uh, Yeah, we'll come back to that in a second. Marcus teasing us about ultrasound as a secret to everything. We've talked about hot topics in 2020. You can you know, make sure you listen to part one and join in. We'll be doing that for the next few days to see where we're going with hot topics. We're now joined by our third guest, which is Jez. Now, forgive me, Jez, if I get this wrong. Zvonenberg. Is that right? Is that, is, that, is, is that correct? Yes. Thanks. Fantastic. Tell us, tell us about yourself. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the invite. I'm uh, the nurse and project lead in London for critical care, working currently with the Northwest London Critical Care Network. Um, a military background, intensive care nurse, responsible for air retrievals, uh, casualty extraction, um, and removal of combat casualties from tough places back to make sure they get safely home. Specialist in transfer medicine, and uh, currently working on patient safety topics and projects. Oh, well, thank thank you for your service. Thank you for all of that. So, in previous years, yes, what sort of places have you been that you're allowed to tell us about? Um, so my first operational tour was in Bosnia, um, served in the Gulf a couple of times, um, never on holiday, yep. um, never to nice places, always seems to be some area of the world, so Iraq, Afghanistan, Sierra Leone, Bosnia, Kosovo, Mogadishu, and then a couple of other places as well. And now settled back to take on the real war zone. Yes, uh, absolutely. Yes, it was always easier. It's much harder. Um, it's much easier to know where the enemy is. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah and the enemy's all around us. Yeah, absolutely. Some of them colleagues. And, um, uh, and we, we've got many more cats to herd, haven't we? I mean, they, they, yes. they, as far as I get the impression, those people in uniforms tend to do what you ask them to do, and ours don't. Uh, that's a misconception. Otherwise, I wouldn't need the military police. Okay. Um, so <laughs> broadly, <laughs> broadly, you know what I mean. Uh, there's a there's a group of like-minded people who are motivated to be in that area, and yeah. they've trained and gone through stuff to get there. But we have the luxury of training and working as a team. So that's yeah. a real difference. Whereas, uh, specifically, if you look at transfer, for example, I would spend two weeks training my team on the equipment before they touched a patient. Yes. We would then go away and do pre-deployment training yes. where we would learn to live together yes. and get to each other's sort of habits and personal habits, and you'd have to knock a few out of people. Then we'd go on pre-deployment training to learn how to fire weapons, etc. You said you had to knock people out. I don't know. I, I, <laughs> Not people together. Okay. And then... That's, that's like a house job. Then you'd work. <laughs> Whereas in the NHS, you collide at the end of a bed. The doctor and the nurse have never met. And you have this sort of awkward conversation about what are you capable of and what am I capable of? And mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. what's your role and what's my role? And who's in charge? Whereas actually in the military, the nurse is the team leader and the doc is there to do the medicine. And it's very simple. <laughs> <laughs> right, we can go home now. That's that one sorted out. Let's just go home and do that. So, uh, top, we'll, we'll come back to your yes. key area I want to talk to you about. Um, hot for 2020. We've had prehab, oxygen, opiates, AI, closed loop. We've had some others thrown in. W- w- where, where do you want to go? Uh, so, I'd like to break it down. So, from the patient's perspective in critical care, I'd like three R's. So, uh, re enablement rehabilitation and readmission okay. which we're seeing some data that shows that critically ill patients discharged are readmitted back to hospital yes. a high proportion of them 50 percent something like that inside the first year yes so to a hospital any patient that's been in critical care is admitted to a hospital somewhere else not necessarily the same one and i'm not sure we know why yes that would be interesting um, the re-enablement and rehabilitation is an ongoing topic for those critically ill patients. We know all the problems of critical care and we haven't cracked yet how to support them better closer to home. Um, the challenge of a clinician in intensive care is when the patient comes back to a follow-up clinic and says, I've got problems with my local authority, my toilet and my uh, money. They don't know. And they go to their GP and say, I've got problem with sexual dysfunction, psychotic thoughts and scarring. They don't know. So there's a yes. gap there for those patients. Um, 
and workforce, and I'd like to break that down into training, competence, and resilience stroke burnout. Burnout from the staff burnout? Yeah, so from yes, the workforce that's perspective. A big, that's a big subject. We've done quite a few interviews about burnout. Um, I found myself sitting through them myself, and Sol and Desiree did some at the Society of Cardiovascular Anesthesiology last year. I found myself sitting there thinking, oh, mm. I think I might have been burnt out at one stage. I recognise these, these traits they're talking about. Mm. So I think, I think we should all learn about it and we should all be yeah. prepared to say, I think I, it might be happening to me. It's definitely happening to you. And so I think that's... Can we a, talk about that? Well, that's a key difference. <laughs> that was meant to, I wasn't I'm pointing at you, Marcus. <laughs> Thank, thanks, Monty. We're, role, we're role-playing here. <laughs> yeah, if you, if you have a burnout, we've all got no hope. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Everboyant. <laughs> oh, so I think that's okay. another key difference for me is as a team leader, as a senior nurse, my military role was specifically to look after the team here, here. And I'm not sure that in the NHS we look after each other. The buddy system isn't there. The team leadership role, you know, unless you've known each other for years and that isn't necessarily as visible. And we could raise that up the agenda, I think. Here, 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 here. So you're going to tell us, uh, we're going to pivot off transfers, yes. for example. Um, yes. So uh, we've, uh, we, uh, collectively, a group of clinicians, have successfully identified key areas we want to work in. And we've implemented some patient safety initiatives such as a transfer bag which um, won a patient safety award in 2017 and we took the premise that you've got all these disparate groups working for patient safety and actually standardizing something would be a good thing and we managed to enable that and introduce that firstly within a network and then it went wider and over a couple of hundred hospitals now across the country using them. You may be familiar with the blue bag. Um, and it has weaknesses. Don't get me wrong. Yes. It's not perfect, but it's better than what we had before, which was different checklists, different content. So if you're a trainee rotating around now, if you're in Northwest London and across London, pocket one is pocket one. doesn't right. matter which hospital you're in. So for those people listening who are not familiar yes. with this challenge, we... Might have a patient, for example, on an intensive care unit. They might be on a breathing machine. They might be on a whole uh, range of drug infusions. And now someone says, let's go and do a fancy x-ray, a CT scan. We've got to put them on a trolley, a gurney. We've got to transfer them to that environment. And that is a transfer within a hospital. And that means we grab equipment. And if you just arrived in the past in hospital, new hospital, you grab the bag. And what's in the bag uh, is a mystery, and where it is in the bag is potentially a mystery. So you've standardised yeah. that, is that right? Standardised that, but also standardised the content so that 80% of your thinking is already done. So every bag is the same, and therefore the patient in front of you right now might have some differences, but because you know the standard content for the bag, okay. you've only got to do 20% of the thinking around that individual patient in front of you. And that was the real winning pocket on the bag, was a patient pocket, which was designed to put that extra bit of kit in. So that's why the bags had mission creep because we're scarred as clinicians. I've had this one patient back in the day who, so I always carry with me the kit that I needed for that one patient just in case. Yes. Um, And we we removed that requirement because you gave the people a pocket for that. Got you. So like I open my laptop here and it's got a QWERTY keyboard. Yes. So therefore, I'm fairly certain I know where the T is and the B is. Yep. Go to other countries, open it, and it might not be there because it's a different keyboard. But yep. the keyboards I get exposed to, I know where those letters are. Indeed. You've given us a bag yep. where if we're looking for the life-saving bit, we know it's in that pocket there. Yeah. We and. Hope. And also, well done, thank you. But we also thank. <laughs> we also try to make it useful to the clinician at the time you need it because it's no good you knowing where it is. Yes, you've got to be clearly able to identify to maybe a non-skilled person yes. who hasn't done your level of training. So the porter who's accompanying you on the yes. transfer, and you're fighting with the patient because they're deteriorating, and you need to them to pass you a piece of kit. So, coloured bag, you know, coloured the pockets identify the checklist on the front to make it quick, easy access yes. during the transfer. Yes, open purple pocket, remove yeah. device, phone wife. Absolutely, that right? that's the kind of thing. I will be late. <laughs> <laughs> so that is that, that's from the front. We'll bring the other guests in the audience in in a second. So from the point of view of the transfer challenge outside the bag, the yep. other thing we were talking in our, our prep earlier was the inter-hospital and intra-hospital transfer. Yes. So we transfer patients and we exchange care 
within hospitals and between hospitals. Now, for the between hospital challenge, you started off, and I cut you off because I didn't want to spoil the good story, about a a hospital, an imaginary hospital somewhere in East London where a patient's arrived, sadly, with a head injury, and what happens next? So... So we have a system whereby we have tertiary centres, but before we get to that stage, a patient arrives and they're in the ED department or the A&E in old money, and uh, they go off to CT scan, so an intra-hospital within the hospital transfer. So and lo- local hospital local on the hospital. edges of London, for example, they bang their head hard, sadly, they're in, they're getting well looked after, but this is not a specialist centre. Yep. And so we take them off to a CT scanner, which as we know is inherently unsafe in terms of the risks to the patient and to the staff Mm. in terms of the preparation and the ongoing management of that patient and as yet that patient hasn't been admitted to the hospital okay because they're still in the emergency department so they're not on the hospital system yet yes um Many of those hospitals are on paper. It's not digitised in any way. And the equipment is from the resus area, not from the critical care. But the critical care team may or may not at this stage be involved in their transfer. It might be the emergency medicine team who are doing their transfer. It might be anaesthetics. It might be intensive care, depending on the setup. So they need very specialist help. Yes. They call the intensive care unit team. The intensive care unit team say, I'm sorry, we're full. Yes. And also, I believe this patient would be better looked after in a highly specialist centre, the sort of place you work, I think, Matt. Is that a highly specialist sort of centre? Yeah, yeah, that's that's sort sort of referral we'd expect to see from one of our... Yeah, uh, so they've, units. they've rung you, Marcus. Are you a sender or a receiver? I'm a sender. Yeah, yeah. I work in a community okay. district general. Yeah. So, so they're then saying, "I'm sorry, they can't stay here. No room at the inn. Yep. We've now got to ask to put that patient in an ambulance and do our best to take them to another place. But they haven't got into the system yet. Is no. What you're saying. So that even if you have a digital system and all the data and all the documentation yeah. is digitised, as yet they've not been admitted to that system because they're an ED department. Um, so we would then arrange the transfer to the specialist team, call an ambulance. Yes. At this stage, it might then be that the team that took them to CT aren't the right team now to take them out of the hospital. It might need a, a different team. It might need somebody who was more comfortable with that or was more comfortable with the potential emergencies that might occur during that transfer because you haven't got the infrastructure and support that you would have within the hospital. That often comes to team anaesthesia because we can do everything, obviously, and do Absolutely. Really well. Yes. And uh, but managing the airway, for example, is one of our skills that goes with that. So often they say, yes. team anaesthesia, could you take patient from here to there? Yes, and you've never met the patient. Yes. So um, you're learning as you go. Here's the patient, hand over. And we start... A different document. So we started a document to take them to the CT scan because there's an element of pre-transfer yes, stabilization yes. and checking. And now we need to start a different document to take them in the ambulance. And neither of those documents are necessarily synced to the, where we're going. Yes, They're not digitized. Um, and they don't work with the ambulance system either. So we're getting... This is all sounding jolly familiar to all of us, I kind of think. There's a lot of nodding going on. Wait, uh, that we can see that is a challenge. Yes. I'm guessing you have got a solution. <laughs> uh, yes. Okay. Bear with me. Yeah. I'm going to use a, some jargon. Yes. So an agnostic, yes. interoperable transfer document. Okay. In other words, something that will talk to any other electronic system that might it, it might have to. Okay. So it could be an app on a mobile phone. It oh, will probably computer, it, whatever. It probably needs to be tablet based okay. just because of the size and the, the, the document. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, but imagine that at the moment, uh, when I go to CT scan or when I go to another hospital, I could take a child because paediatrics are now pushing more my way, or it could be an adult. Yes. They might be ventilated, they might not be. I might be going within the hospital, I might be going in an ambulance. And all of those binary decisions will change the size of my transfer form. Yes. At the minute, I have to have a huge A3 piece of paper because just in case I take a level three patient, right. that's the sickest ventilated type patient, I need all the space for all those checks. But I also want the document for the self-ventilating AAA that needs to go to a cardiac center, but maybe I don't want all the bells and whistles on them because I want to keep them as they are. Yeah, so I, I can I can feel people I can hear people salivating, chomping at the bit to say, yes. "Come on, this is a you know this is a high school project for somebody. This is a very Absolutely. maybe it's an MSc project for somebody 
but but it's not. Come on, you can have this done by the next week, can't you? Yes, uh, unfortunately, it has <laughs> three, 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 two words and one abbreviation right. to it, and that is big yes. IT. NHS. Okay. <laughs> and when you mix those things together, it's an anagram, people run off into the distance. <laughs> so you mean when we make we our problem experts, the panel of problem experts get together and tell you why you can't do that. It's not as easy as you're making it sound. Uh, so uh, I can tell you, and I have people who have vouched for the fact that I must have met 10 different people in what was then NHS Digital, NHS X, NHS EI, and so on all of whom were enablers to make this happen. We've structured something that would work. But, of course, the challenge is is that it's the what's in it for me question, which is if I'm a trust and the tertiary centre, you'll have your IT system. The ambulance will have their IT system. And why on earth would you two agree what that would be? And then you'll have your IT system. Um, my ED might have a different IT system well, hang on a to second. the well, ITU. They're, they're, all, they're all computers, aren't they? And yes. I can talk to you with my computer. This is a popular brand from the North America that sounds a bit fruity. Yes. And I could, <laughs> if you had one of those other ones, the, yes. I could talk to you via it. What's, what's, it's not that but that's hard, not true, is it? is it? I mean, even the fruity one and my I at least uh, an one that looks like I look through it in pain yeah. um, would be difficult. There's, inter- there's interoperability challenges, aren't there? I can send you an email. Can't I? Yes. Okay. So there's more than... If you think about it in terms of the practicalities, as a clinician, yep. I can telemetrize the observations, but I'm stood there looking at the patient. So the telemetry bit is nice, but it's recording the obs. So what? I want to be able to overlay the transfer, the pre-transfer stabilization, the patient's condition, the topography of my journey. Have I been in a lift? Have I turned left or right in an ambulance? What speed did I accelerate at? I want to overlay that onto the patient's physiology, the alteration of pumps as I go, and any interactions that I do, so that at the end of it, I can hand over, and you can sign something that says, I've received this patient, and they were lovely. Are you working on this? Yes. Good. How long Um, do we have to wait? Yet, please don't hold your breath. Um, <laughs> but but this is the other problem, is that we've got all the different industry and partners and people looking at it. So I think we have to break it down. There's something about competence that's probably coming in ahead, ahead of it in terms of training on equipment, because actually, as a risk to patients, this doesn't necessarily... The digital transfer of documentation doesn't solve the risk to patients. Yes. So better training on equipment, standardising that is probably a quicker win, a better win for the base clinicians who are working and doing these transfers day in, day out. And this is a nice-to-have um, aspirational thing because it will... F- inform training and transfer in the future but actually i'd rather everybody was trained in transfer first so so i mean it's often referred to is we as one of the biggest employers one of the biggest joined up healthcare systems in the world we're a relatively small country but quite populated but the nhs we should sort of have you know data sharing data openness it should all happen seamlessly i think the rest of the world thinks it does we think it happens in america because they've got Cerner and epic so they can, or there are the systems available, but where you can plug in and you get the answer straight away, which I don't think is true either. Well, why, why, why can't we just do it in the NHS? Um, I'm not sure I can answer that. I suppose what I can say is that there are some people who do it better and we could learn from them. I think there's something about what data is it and how are you going to use it because everybody's interested in collecting data. So uh, last year we looked at um, ICNARC data for critical care and transfers when we were publishing the up, or updating the guidance on it for the Intensive Care Society and it was very difficult to find any incident reports in our data systems across over 630,000 transfers because what I say is an issue with a ventilator so I might tick a box that says there was an incident with a ventilator but you might think that that's because you dropped it. I might think it's because it stopped working, and you might think it's because the battery ran out, but we still all tick the same box. So within the level of data, we've got to decide what is it we want to look at. And actually, there's compelling evidence that if somebody fills in a form, the transfer is safer. So that's probably where we need to start in terms of patient safety, is that if we could guarantee that every patient transfer 
had some kind of evidence of pre-transfer stabilisation, that would be a great place to start. So I, was, I work at University College London Hospitals, and I was sent this launch document very recently, EMAP, E-M-A-P. Yes. The Translational Data Science, built for the NHS. Yes. Made at UCLH. Beautiful. EMAP is a translational data science platform built in and for the NHS. It contains over 100 million health data items from UCLH with 500 added every minute. Currently includes demographics, vital signs, lab tests and more. And they're claiming it's open source. Clinicians, yes. data scientists, app developers, hospital management and patients yes. can muck in. So just drop them a note. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> and, and then what would be nice is to map the patient experience of transfer. Which would be... Very well, and relatives as well. Yes. G- gentlemen, before we get into open this up, the whole thing, would you like to ask each other a question or challenge each other on anything you've heard tonight before I open it up to the audience and open it up to uh, Slido? I think the whole transfer thing is fascinating. And I speak as a person who's unsuccessfully applied for our various royal colleges to look into this as in terms of our national audit projects. Yeah. Because I think the situation you describe, transfer to CT, transfer to a tertiary centre, you've very beautifully... Um, describe the challenges that occur at staff and patient levels and we do this all the time that's not a rare event this is a daily occurrence in most centres we work but we have no idea how many transfers we do where the patients are going who's accompanying them and the issues that happen and it's easier just as, as you said Monty often just sucks it up but we have virtually no idea of the scale of what we do if this was any other intervention this sort of level of risk and this frequency and you know, I don't need to tell you how exposed you feel in, in an ambulance on a dual carriageway with an unstable patient. There are very few situations guaranteed to make you feel deeply, un- as deeply uncomfortable as that. And nauseous. And nauseous. Yes. Um, we just At don't know. At least you do have service stations, whereas um, some of the other transfers, they don't even have that. Um, <laughs> so Ke- Kevin, Kevin Fong, who, who uh, is at UCLH, who some of you may have listened to the 13 Minutes to the Moon podcast series on the BBC over Christmas. He's a front yeah. person for the BBC. He's also, you know, doctor, does air ambulance work as well. As a junior doctor, he, he you might have heard this story, Marcus, maybe yeah. around at the time. Yeah. He was on a transfer, and if yeah. I get this wrong, yeah. they were doing a transfer for a patient in extremis from another critical care unit as a young doctor. The ambulance got into a crash situation. It ended up, as far as I remember, hitting a, a, a traffic light. It ended up sort of pitch pulled on the traffic light. It ended up spilling yeah. petrol around there. And he had to make a decision with oxygen everywhere, how to get the patient and himself out of a now crashed ambulance. Yeah. You know, he does talk about this. It's in the public yeah, domain. Yeah, yeah. So I'm not just sensationalizing it tonight. But, but it's that. It's kind of, wow, that yeah. was... That's a tough checklist, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Bad, bad, thing. <laughs> <laughs> bad things happen to Kev, doesn't he? He's been involved in lots of exciting things just yeah. by being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Maybe, or the right place at the right maybe time. Maybe he plans it. I don't know. We'll have to talk to him about it. <laughs> So anything else, anything between the, all of you before we open it up to people? Well, I, I, I'm really interested in remote supervision. And I, I just wonder if there's also a bit of role for that maybe in your system, that it could be uh, monitored from an external position, that, that you can have a senior person helping you know, and, and advising and stuff. Do you see that? There's happening? a couple of uh, models. Denmark have a critical care paramedic system where they have a doctor in a base. I am really concerned about the remote monitoring conversations because they will inevitably be picked up as a workforce saving mm. and somebody will say ah good mm. you can sit in a bunker and watch 10 screens okay. and uh, before you know it you've got air traffic control until something goes wrong so the, I, I, th- I agree I think there's some conversations to be had I think in this country we've got critical care practitioners who are coming on board I would challenge what is the point of the doctor on the transfer for airway management? Because if they've got a tube in, your job is to hold the tube. We've got one nod and one uh, remote stationary. Well, 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 well <laughs> neonatal transfers don't have uh, doctors. In, no, in absolutely. My and, and, and I think often, mm. in terms of transfers, particularly from a smaller district general, you send the person who impacts upon your hospital yeah. the least. So if you send your one of your senior nieces, the hospital may yeah. stop. Yeah. Uh, you know, theatre stops, the obstetric unit stops. So you send the most junior person. So the idea of having the most junior person who maybe does one every six months or may have never done any, versus mm-hmm. a critical care practitioner who does it semi-professionally, mm-hmm. I, I think I know who will but be interested in delivering the service. And interestingly for me, if they were self-ventilating, 
Is that breathing? Sorry, yes, yeah. breathing. Um, or had <laughs> some kind of non-invasive... <laughs> yes, or had some kind of non-invasive um, form of ventilation. Well, I'll, you I'll might to uh, deep, deep self-ventilate yes. for a second. <laughs> you <laughs> might not send somebody anaesthetic, no. but actually those are the people that I want the anaesthetic skills yes. because... Otherwise, I've got to wait for them to die before I can put a tube in. They are the most difficult transfers, yeah. from my perspective. Yeah. The ones that might de- deteriorate, because yeah. you have to have so many people and all the drugs and all the skills, and it's uh, they're very and they take a long time to muster. Yeah. So it takes. Yeah, they're they're very tr- tricky. So I, I think that's uh, it. I would. I'm not wanting to get rid of the doctor on the transfer. I suppose my question is, what what is the right team? for yes. the transfer and what's the purpose of those people on the team who is the team leader in the NHS that isn't clear um, if you ask a room of people we do this every transfer course we run in North West London who's in charge all the nurses put their hand up for the doctor all the doctors put their hand up for the nurse <laughs> that means no one's in charge <laughs> well it's a, it's a highly skilled highly specialised area and uh, when it's done well it's done really well so hands up please if you'd like to ask a question or make a comment we'll get a microphone to you while we're working on that, we'll take some questions from Slido. What is the one thing that the NHS critical care team could learn from a military medical team? You've got to try just one, because I'm thinking there's probably a list. I suppose for me it's the training together in the role. So if I look at, I'm an ALS instructor, and I will, so that's advanced life support yeah. in this country, ACLS in other countries, and currently uh I will be watching six junior doctors stood around a bed, two of them pretending to be nurses, training for the MDT situation. Makes no sense. Makes no sense. So training in role for the role you're going to be doing with the people that you're going to be doing that role with would be useful. Do you think healthcare industries are moving fast enough to combat negative environmental impacts of anaesthesia? You take that. Um, I'm going to bounce this back the other way. Are healthcare professionals moving fast there enough to compact it. Because if mm. we tell the manufacturers that's what we will buy, yes. they will do it. Yeah. So, for example, the uh, attachments of the Clausen harness that appear on most masks. Yes. I haven't... I've, I started anesthesia in 1999. I've never used the Clausen harness yet, but they have been on every single mask. I've up. One Twitter campaign this year, most companies are wiping them out. Because that was a plastic ring that was around the the mask that we use for anaesthesia, and it was there that you could put uh, a a sort of web being bit around the head and hold the mask on, which I I saw used a long, long, long time ago when we didn't have laryngeal masks and things like that. But as you say, when was the last time we saw one of those? That was a ring of plastic unnecessarily every time. Uh, on, On every single mask. But one Twitter campaign within two or three months the pushback has come. They will be driven by market forces. The consumers are the powerful people here. You vote with your feet. You tell them what they want. You go to alternative providers and they will do it. It is a business and they they want to do what their competition aren't offering. So I think we need to take responsibility for this. And I think we could build on that with a sustainability argument, which is if the packaging is built right, that you know recycling critical care uses huge amounts of consumables and the opportunity to recycle. We've looked at that recently um, we've had national conversations, there's some interesting projects going on, but the packaging doesn't help and then you need the infection control teams to come on board. So I think that we can influence industry that way. Do you think we'd be prepared to, because would you think we'd be prepared to pay more? I mean, there's a movement in the clothing I see now with youngsters and some of my friends that they're starting to buy clothes for life mm. as opposed to, mm. trend, you know, because we used to have clothing that last, that was built well was reassuringly expensive but lasted a lifetime I'd love to see some of your trousers from your early years <laughs> <laughs> kids would nick them all <laughs> are we would we be prepared to pay the premium for the do you think we'll get that tipping point whereby we say we're prepared to pay the premium I mean at the end of the day we have to yeah I, I, I don't think it's optional I think we have to uh, create enough noise that it's clinically driven I was looking at um, people making my sandwiches in my canteen at work and I was watching the gloves go on and the gloves go off and it made me think, goodness me, you know, all this stuff we consume every day, every patient, I wonder if we could make that recyclable and, you know, I don't know how that could be done, but, you know, we could we could make that happen if we really wanted We've to. We've been dropping the, you know, we've gone into the ITU where everyone had to put the apron on to yeah, get yeah. in the vicinity of the patient. We've yeah. been dealing with that Just one as well, that. a lot of plastic in there. Yeah. Okay. What are the main challenges in treating your patients that AI could help solve today and tomorrow? 
I'm really interested in AI. I think it's yep. going to radically change the world I work in in ultrasound. AI, artificial yeah, intelligence. Indeed. In fact, and, and machine learning and so on. I think it's going to almost do us out of a job in uh, you know decades' time in some ways. But What's it going to do for us first? In well, your there's world? already stuff there around uh, that helps us. You know, and, and I touched on cardiac output monitoring and, and flow. And those are the kind of borderline areas that sit between basic echo and advanced echo. And... Um, yeah, machines like the Vision already do auto aortic VTI. So they look at the flow running across the aortic valve and uh, and will give you a real time readout. And that and that talks it, it lends itself to variability and and it lends us to you know doing an intervention and seeing if it improves. And you don't you know the machine does a lot of that work for you. And I think we're just going to see year on year that kind of thing grow and make the whole of um, echocardiography and other ultrasound more accessible and, uh, and you know, more useful. I think if we could identify algorithms that would pre-select deteriorating patients out on the wards, that would inform the outreach teams and the clinicians before they went to see them, and that could make new scoring, so national early warning scoring, more sophisticated, adding in some more of the data together. Yes, please, sir. Could you introduce yourself? Um, hi, my name is Shagan. I'm a registrar in intensive care in London. Should there be a standardised retrieval team for transfers both out of hospital and in hospital nationwide? Question to the entire panel. You may start. Okay, so I, I have a bias here. Uh, I used to run a retrieval service uh, for a very bespoke group. Uh, when I was in a district DGH, I implemented training for that team by taking the NHS transfers and was asked to stop because I was de-skilling the internal teams because we were doing all the transfers from one hospital to another and they were getting less exposure to the transfers to the CT scan. So the patients were getting a two-tier service. Retrieval services will offer a two-tier service. What we're saying there is intra-hospital transfers cobble together a team but there's a minute we go from one hospital to another, specialist service. Mm. So I, I, I can see the, the argument. The specialist teams, such as our extracorporeal membrane oxygenation teams and our paediatric retrieval teams, are demonstrating great stuff. And there's compelling evidence that specifically trained teams make it safer. So I get all of that, but you've got to work out a way. And then what do they do when they're not doing transfers? You want to come back on that for a second? We go to our other two. I was just going to say, my specific question was, should we standardise it for both? So including in hospital. So have a dedicated retrieval team yep. who just do transfers all day, every day in hospital and maybe have a rotating team. So a dedicated transfer like team in hospital. Yes. So if you're going for from position A to the position Chris B. Clean, the Chris Clean all transfers. Um, and if you, okay, so 10-bedded uh, intensive care unit, 4-bedded resus bay, five or six deteriorating patients out in the wards per day. How many transfers? Probably in the region of 10 or 15 a day. Then one goes to another hospital. The cost of those teams would... It, and you'd never have them in the right place. You'd be in CT when I need you in theatre. I'd be in theatre when you're off at the other hospital or in the back of an ambulance. And then how do I get you back if you go to another hospital. Now, if we had interchangeable teams so that if I'm taking, you're taking your patient and you're delivering to you and then you've got a patient to go back, you'll pick them up as well, but then you'll say, well, no, that's not my patient. Oh. And the ambulance service have to be involved in that as well because they'll say, well, hang on, we've done that journey, but now we haven't got a patient. I think it's worth looking at. I know that there are a couple of pilots around the country looking at retrieval services, but they are looking specifically at the time critical transfer and that will negate and disadvantage a whole group of our patients and make it less equitable for them. I work in a district general and we have uh, patients coming through the ED that have thoracic dissections and that causes quite a lot of uh, difficulty, you know, about who, you know, who should go. Is it the anaesthetic team? If they're hemodynamically stable or even hypotensive, what value is an anaesthetist uh, who's skilled with libetalol? Because you just need, you need to go quickly. 
Uh, on the other hand, I, I personally think that anyone with a you know raised blood pressure absolutely needs to have an anaesthetist or an intensivist who's familiar with labetalol that can manage that for the journey. And I think you, your system's got to have redundancy mm. to pick these up. And sometimes they're really easy. You know, anyone with respiratory failure gets intubated is going to need an anaesthetist. But it's the ones that are on the borderline that cause the difficulty. And ED are very busy in the hospital I work in. They are not, you know, and they look to us because we've got a little bit of redundancy in the service. Uh, and I think it's um, having a specific team would be great, but there's still the muster time. They've got to still get to you, haven't they? And that, 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 that's critical time in, in, in a lot of the people we're trying to move. And the resupply time. Uh, during the Afghanistan, we had an air bridge between UK and Afghanistan. And even with four teams working mm. constantly around mm. the clock, taking seven or eight patients at a time, I had the luxury of moving the most number of patients in a single move who were all ventilated but the the reality of that resupply isn't seen the other thing is it's an unfair question sometimes which is you ask clinicians would you like a retrieval service to take the problem away from you and everybody says yes that's not the right question necessarily final comment on this um i think there's value in considering this the whole team i accept all the uh, the barriers and the problems there in sheffield we have itu technicians who accompany most of our transfers. When they're not doing the transfers, they set up ventilators, they help you do bronchoscopy, they can set up CVVH machines. They are busy the rest of the time. It does mean there is one standard skilled person, yes. expert in transfer, who accompanies every transfer in, in, uh, in, intra and into hospital. So that means if you are sending your more junior uh, anaesthetic trainee or a non-anaesthetic trainee, there is a single experienced person there. You know, the teams you describe for the military, they're, they're the gold standard, but they're expensive mm. and probably not pragmatic across the NHS. But I think the idea of having a group of experts mm. um, available all the time uh, would make a big difference. And evaluating it, if piloting and evaluating something would be very valuable. If anyone wants the microphone, please put your hand up and we'll get it to you. We have at the front here, uh, Sol, we have a, another. There we go. Another question from the crowd. I'm Dusty Kirkbelly, I'm an anaesthetist intensivist, I'm in Guildford in Surrey, just around the corner from Marcus. There's a question from Matt. Um, you know, you're talking about the, the types of anaesthesia that we deliver, and we're talking about volatiles versus any sort of propofol. We haven't really had any new anaesthesia drugs for quite a while. There's probably one maybe sort of coming this year, but it's not really pitched at anaesthesia. You talked about consumer power. Do you not think it's about time then perhaps that we said, you know what, what we really need when we are taught about these perfect anaesthesia agents, is it about time we actually had one? And sort of speak to a farmer and say, can we have one please? Rather than just saying, do you know what, we can make billions and billions of pounds and dollars on biologics and Netflix, Netflix and Mabs and things like that. Um, I'm going to paraphrase a line from Nick Grimes who wrote a tongue-in-cheek article for the journal Anesthesia. And he opens it by saying, anaesthesia is safe really really safe and that's the problem yeah is that if you are going to if you are the ceo of your pharmaceuticals agency and you just say right i want you to invent a new agent this will cost you billions in development costs and you've got to somehow make it better than propofol or sevoflurane both of which have issues but in terms of patient experience i've been in these with both pretty good in both i use them both they both work really well the number of complications directly attributable to either agent are vanishingly small. And then this new agent is going to be eye-wateringly expensive because I've spent $9 billion pounds developing it. So I'm going to then sell it back to the NHS and say, would you like this new agent that actually probably won't reduce length of stay? Maybe it might hurt a little bit less when you inject it. Maybe it might come out of your lungs a little bit quicker. But it will increase your budget for an individual trust by £50 million pounds or dollars. I know what my chief executive will say. So if I'm running, if I'm running the pharmaceutical agent, I'm going, I'm sorry, guys, what you've got is so good, I'm not going to invest. Well, I, I'm going to find your problem areas. I'm going to go to your cancers and your tumours and your other areas where we can make a big difference um, and focus my energies there. Right, great conversation. Quick fire questions, quick fire answers. Marcus, what other applications for ultrasound and critical care medicine? Intracranial pressure. Airway assessment, uh, advanced stuff within the abdomen. Uh, it goes on and on. And I think we're going to see. Is there anywhere that. you don't stick your probe? No. 
<laughs> really, Monty? Uh, <laughs> didn't think I'd be asked that. Um, I, I, uh, we, we're, we're looking in the early stage of, of developing a focused TOE uh, system that I think will, 12 months down the line will start to see proliferate, and that's going to really impact on anaesthesia. But those so. diagrams I see, seriously, it's like eyeballs, and it's <laughs> worth looking eyeballs? everywhere. Yeah, yeah, it really is. There's no limit to what can be done. It's just a question of training and governance. Current sh- I'm going to bring Sol Aronson on this in a second as well. Current shortfalls in training of the anaesthetist, the use of ultrasound. Firstly, uh, it's letting everyone know that it's as relevant for anaesthetists as it is for intensivists. Then it's about uh, trying to get the trainers out there and getting them to uh, to deliver that. And I think deliverability has always been the been, been the issue. It's about accessing mentors where you work so that you can learn and and practice where you are. And you know, I think uh, we try our best to cover the country, and we've done pretty well. We've got about eight nine hundred mentors registered up and down the country, but we still need twice as many. And uh, I think remote supervision is going to be part of this solution in the future there are some fantastic stuff uh, okay where you can scan in one location and, and witness images in another and i think that's going to make a big difference so dr sol aronson from duke university medical center one of the vice chairs there but also extremely well known as being one of the was it gang of six that managed to wrestle that managed to wrestle uh, ultrasound away from the cardiologists perioperatively back in the day come to terms okay. uh, in ter- in, in, with respect to what makes best sense. I, first of all, let me just simply say I really am enjoying this conversation. Kudos to all of you on the panel. Uh, I, I guess I was invited to speak to the ultrasound question, and I, I would just simply say it's really tough to balance that tension between accessibility and competency um, and, and having that sort of threshold of what you would consider a a good balance my bias and it's always been my bias since the beginning of time when i was much taller um, (laughs) that that i think what you pointed out earlier in the conversation i think when monty was asking if he should go back and learn how to pick up a probe and do something interesting with it i'll just leave your imaginations to uh follow through on that i I think no matter where you are with your level of competency ultrasound will make you smarter it will it will enable you to know things that you heretofore would not have known and so i think there's an element of um that being a truth and and so i'm very much in favor of the accessibility bias on that dichotomy of accessibility and competency i do think there should be some threshold i think we should be careful to police ourselves and, and enable ourselves to have credibility. Um, but I think we have to be very careful of putting that bar too high and, and um, limiting, if you will, our opportunities to grow and get smarter and get better. Because I think it's a, a linear uh, curve rather than a step function. Because I was allowed to use a stethoscope and I was barely competent. And I think that's a very a good example. The, I'm saying with a stethoscope. Well. Yeah, I could never hear but, this. But the but point being, the more you used it, yeah. I would dare say, um, the, the more clever you got yeah. and and i think that's true with uh, ultrasound yeah. in general as well completely agree do you think ultra, there's a lot of answer ai personalized medicine and rethinking design for patient experience what will the next generation of medical devices be like anyone have a go at that one? Oh, we use lots of monitoring I'd, I'd like them to be wireless portable and have better battery lives Okay. I really, you know, you think that would be a, a quick win in the 21st century, but that causes more problems and angst and delays more things than anything else I've ever, yeah. I'm sure you never even transferred up. Yeah, I think the battery technology needs to be smarter. It's got to be, and, you know, some kind of reusable, regenerable energy support as well. Deep learning is going to completely change echocardiography and yes. ultrasound completely. It's going to take out all the intraoperative uh, operator variability. It's going to do all the measurements. It's going to be. It's going to give us everything we ever need. And I, I'm, I'm a bit sad about that because in ten years' time I might be out of a job. Well, I don't think you will. Mm? You think? I just think it'll make your job more fun Good. and the patient care better. Good. Yeah. I, I would weigh in on that. I don't. Mm. I don't think it's going to take the physician or the provider out of mm. the loop. I think it's going to make it easier for you to make decisions about when it's appropriate to do something or to believe what you did to be true mm. uh, based on sensitivities and specificities. But I don't think you're going to be eliminated from that loop. Good. So you're all right. Thanks. You'll be fine. Oh, I feel so much better now. You have to work. <laughs> until you're about <laughs> seventy-five. You get your pension. Anyway, That's so right. Before. What improvements would you like to see in transport? Last few minutes. Um, I'd like to see it recognised as a thing on its own that is relevant and highly valued in the NHS. I'd like to see 
training for every single clinician so that every patient is moved by somebody who is transfer trained and uh, once we've done that then we can move on with the technical stuff and the really clever stuff I think. If you had an endless pot of money what would you create stroke do? Oh I've lost the question now. Mm. (laughs) To make life better for your patients the patient experience in your area of expertise Matt will take yours. I'm going to answer this question wearing my major trauma hat yep. and what we need to learn from the military isn't what they've done at the sharp end but what they've done at the cold end and our cold care of patients our rehab our psychology input the way we see them in outpatient clinic they come you know they've five body parts injured they come to five different outpatient clinics yes. we can do so much better in providing yeah. joined up care and actually get the patients back to where they want independent working yeah. life and I think sometimes we look at short-term outcomes, mortality, length of stay crystal care, that's not patient-centred. Is there a use for ultrasound in sepsis, Marcus? Sepsis, uh, in terms of picking out a lung, a, se- a source of sepsis, definitely. Uh, it's much more sensitive and specific than chest X-ray and clinical examination. And particularly maybe in the management of sepsis, looking to exclude uh, the, the cardiac component and to, in- uh, to guide fluid management in the early resuscitation phase, definitely. Do you see nurses performing ultrasound in the ICU? Oh, uh, and if not, why not? A hundred percent. This is not just for doctors. This is for every allied healthcare professional and clinician. I, I, and so we, we uh, teach anyone who wants to. I think it's really important. In fact, uh, uh, particular nurses, outreach nurses, specialist nurses, intensive care nurses are, are key deliverers because they don't migrate like trainees. So um, I'm going to have to stop, I'm afraid, with the Slido questions because we are out of time. I just have to say a very big thank you to all of you for giving your time up and generously contributing to this conversation. So a round of applause for that. Once again, thank you very much indeed to GE Healthcare for their very generous sponsorship. We've had a lot of fun this evening. Please don't hesitate to do this again quite often. (laughs) You have our full support. Uh, so uh, travel safely folks please do join us on topmedtalk.com as I say we send out a podcast every day of the week it is completely free loads of people now listen to it on their commute to work so they can be smarter than the first person they walk into because as we say now you could have heard it here first on Top Med Talk is what it would have been thank you for our team for supporting us tonight thank you very much indeed thank you and good night Top Med Talk Thanks for downloading Top Med Talk. The time has arrived for you to get yourself your ticket to Ebpom Dingle. That's right. One of the most famous conferences in the perioperative sphere is going ahead. We've taken Ebpom Dingle virtual. The 22nd Current Controversies in Anesthesia and Perioperative Medicine and SIAA Autumn Congress will go ahead virtually. Live from Dingle Island, you can attend this incredible conference. Spoken of frequently here on Top Med Talk in hallowed terms, it is, of course, a place that is known to produce results. Ed Pom Dingle. Check out edpom.org and get yourself online for the conference of the year. Ed Pom Dingle 2020.